Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. With that, we, uh, I think he's down, are you down in Texas, Scott Wobber, joining us? Uh, I'm uh, headed there uh, in shortly, very shortly. Oh, good. Great. Well, hey, thanks for doing this today. I really appreciate it because, I mean, <laughs> hey, it, it's it, when you play in the World Series, uh, the start of the next season comes up quickly. Uh, so <laughs> that's what's happened there. Uh, so let's get to what you see with this team. And I want before I get to the team, when you watch the JT Real Mojo thing the other day with the home plate umpire, what the yeah. heck was that? Yeah, I mean, so I watched it on TV. I wasn't at that game, but um, yeah. and haven't had a chance to ask JT about it. But a colleague of mine did, and uh, you know, JT seemed as confused as anyone. Um, my sense was that the umpire, um, who is a Triple A umpire who fills in occasionally at the major league level, uh, that the umpire's impression was that maybe JT was showing him up by moving the glove because Craig Kimbrell had just gotten called for a pitch clock violation. Um, you know, I think umpires are especially sensitive these days about this because they have to enforce these rules uh, and uh, don't want to take any uh, any lip from some players who don't like it. So I don't know if he thought that JT was trying to show him up and so he threw him out of the game or what it was, but... Um, you know, look. Um, you know, it's all part of baseball's brave new world. You got to comply with these rules, and if um, if you take too long, you're going to get a, a pitch violation, and the umpires don't want to hear it if you do. Scott, I want to tell you, I don't know how many people were at the game. Not a single person bought a ticket to watch him umpire. Okay, so um, that's just my impression. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. And they, they certainly want to see JT Real Muto in the game. Um, but look, I mean, if that's what it was about, and that's that's, I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of trying to get inside the inside the mind of the umpire there. Um, you know, that's, well, I agree. That's I understand what, they, what you're doing. You know, um, if that's what it was about, you know, look, um, umpires don't want to hear it. So, yeah, I mean. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how this goes. I think baseball's hope was that a lot of this stuff would get ironed out in spring training. You know, mm-hmm. like, hey, if you take too long, we're going to call something on you. We don't want to hear it. Let's let's move on. And um, I don't know. I think for the most part it went fairly smoothly in the spring. So hopefully, whatever it was, they all get it out of their system and they move forward. Yeah, no. Because I guess the previous one, he'd thrown the ball back to the pitcher himself. And I think that's what JT thought he was going to do again. It's like, I'm not going to hold my glove here. He's just going to throw it back out. I was like, what a mess. Okay. Yeah, and there so, was also some talk that, like, Kimberl already had a ball. I'm not sure, but, yeah, yeah. no, I mean, it was it was definitely, um, you know, I do. I feel bad for those people who were there who wanted to see one of the Phillies' better players, and they mm-hmm. didn't get a chance to see him as much as they thought they would. The use of the pitch clock shaved 26 minutes off of spring training games this spring compared to last year's uh, – Grouping games lasted two thirty-five. Now spring training's a little bit different, but what kind of difference is that making in your opinion as you watch it? Oh, it's noticeable, um, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> so I found myself watching a game the other day, and it was—it felt like it was taking forever. Like it felt like it was just dragging, especially in the late innings. And I looked up at the end of the game, and the time of game was three oh one. I mean, there were times last year and previous in the last few years where you'd kill for 301 because that was a short game by comparison. So if 301 feels like it's taking forever, uh, then you know it's working um, because, you know, those are starting to feel long. And I think it's good. I mean, look, I appreciate as much as everybody else the fact that, um, you know, uh, the, the cat and mouse game between hitter and pitcher and hitter stepping out and pitcher stepping off and all of that. But at the same time, and I think we've talked about this before, um, you know, uh, baseball has a problem with with pace of play and action in the game. Uh, The the uh, the consumer is different now than than the consumer used to be. We all have less time. 
we all have more options. Baseball has to kind of get on with the times a little bit here. And what are they cutting out? They're cutting out dead time, wasted time, mm-hmm. time that you'd want back in your normal life. And so, you know, I think that this is a good thing that baseball is trying to speed things up. The faster, the better, as far as I'm concerned. If you can get down to you know, an average game of like two and a half. That's what it was like when I was growing up, you know, and I'm not that old. Me too. Um, you know, I remember in the 80s and 90s when games would move along. And so, you know, I think baseball realizes it has a problem and it's trying to kind of um, to try to fix it before it's too late. No Reese Hoskins this year after what happened at first base. So it's Derek Hall. And Hall in the spring did hit five home runs and he hit 316. Can he hold that down on an everyday basis, or might it be some moving parts like Alec Bone or maybe JT once in a while? Well, I think Derek Hall's going to get a chance to hold it down uh, off the bat. And, um, you know, I don't know that you'll see him play. I don't I don't think you'll see him play against tough lefties, um, you know, no matter what. Like, I'm not sure he's going to be playing against Max Fried or – when they face, you know, some of the better lefties in the league. Um, but they are going to give him a chance to hit lefties, which they didn't really do last year. You know, you look at what they did when they called him up uh, to replace Bryce Harper uh, when Harper broke his uh, his thumb, and it was like, look, we're going to have Derek Hall play the majority of games as the DH, uh, and that meant facing right-handed pitching, but he didn't play against lefties. And I think they're going to they're going to give him a chance to hit lefties this year but I also think they realize that there are other ways that they can uh, put together a lineup without Reese Hoskins and be a pretty good team or at least um, at least help themselves in other areas. And one of those ways is uh, is by, by playing Edmundo Sosa. Um, Rob Thompson really likes Sosa a lot. Uh, he's a really good defender. He plays a lot of different positions. Uh, I do think you could see Sosa getting some time at third base when they feel like either moving Alec Bohm to first um, against a, a tough lefty, for example, or maybe they want to DH Alec Bohm on a given day. Um, they're going to use Sosa, and they're going to use him a lot. So I do think that there are ways that they're going to look to to get his bat in the lineup or his glove and his bat in the lineup uh, and, uh, and try to do some things to make themselves better. They're going to try to rotate Castellanos and Schwarber in that DH spot even a little bit before Bryce Harper gets gets back um so you know they're going to try to do some things uh to make themselves better in a lot of different ways and having Derek Hall try to play every day is is one of those ways Aaron Nola is going to be the opening day starter he's 29 years of age he's he's scheduled to make 16 million this year it's also the last year they're going to table any talks until the end of the season he just wants to concentrate on the year what was your thought on that yeah I think that they um I know that they kind of ramped up their talks um, after spring training started. And, you know, I don't know how close they got. Obviously not very close because they they, they tabled those talks on, I believe it was Saturday or Sunday, um, and they still had, you know, three or four days before opening day. He didn't really want this to, to you know, drag into the season. If he was going to do a new deal, he wanted to do it before. So if they were close – uh, I'm sure they would have continued talking right up until four o'clock tomorrow, you know, to try to get something done. I took a look earlier in the off season at what it would take to to keep Aaron Nola to sign him beyond 2023, and in doing that, I kind of looked at um, some extensions that were signed by pitchers last year. Uh, Luis Castillo was one of them. Uh, after he got traded over to Seattle at the deadline, he signed an extension that was in line with the free agent deals that were made last winter, not this past one, but the one prior to that. So Robbie Ray, Kevin Gosman, they signed contracts that were in the, you know, five or six year, 100 to 110, 115 million dollar range. Well, Castillo signed an extension that was in line with that. So if you spin it forward and, you know, the pitching market kind of exploded this year in free agency, and it wasn't just at the top of the market with Verlander, uh, and DeGrom, it was other pitchers as well, pitchers who are really, really good pitchers like Carlos Rodon and guys that I'm sure that Aaron Nola uh, compares himself to uh, and thinks he is as good as or better than. 
and Rodon signed a six-year, $162 million deal, which I kind of thought was the floor for any sort of NOLA discussions going forward this spring. Um, obviously, they didn't get to where NOLA wanted to go, whether that was uh, my, my, my sense is that maybe it was closer to $200 million over seven or eight years, whatever it was. Um, you know, certainly if you're Aaron Nola and you are now six months away from free agency, seven months away from free agency, when you're going to have an opportunity to talk to 29 clubs in addition to the Phillies, um, you know, that's enticing. Um, and if you're the Phillies, this was your chance, your best chance uh, to re-sign him because you're not negotiating with anyone but him. Uh, you have no competition for him at this point. So this is not to say that they can't still come together and get a deal done after the season. Plenty of free agents go out on the market and wind up with the team that they were just with. Uh, the Phillies did it with J.T. Real Muto a few years ago. He went into free agency, wound up right back with the Phillies. So it could happen. But, um, you know, I, they just didn't get to, to the figure that they wanted to. And I thought they might because there's mutual interest on both sides. But, um, you know, they'll play it out and see how it goes and uh, see where Nola ends up when, uh, when he reaches the market. In other conversations, Scott, we have discussed the new rules, and we also, and I already brought up the pitch clock in this one. Here's one you and I really have not talked about, and I don't. It really hasn't been talked about a lot, in my opinion. And that's the balanced schedule. At least it's called a balanced schedule. You're going to play 13 games against division rivals. That's 52. Each team will play six games against six other opponents, and seven games against four opponents in the same league. That gets you to 64 more. Then each team will play 46 interleague games. What is your thought? You know, so you end up playing the other 29. So what is your thought on this type of scheduling and the potential effect it can have in a pennant race? Yeah, that's that's a really detailed breakdown. I think the easiest way to understand it is everyone plays everyone, right? So you play all 30 teams yep. every single year. I don't know. I mean, I guess I like it. Um, I'm a little bit of a traditionalist. You know, I, I've, I've, I'm lucky in that... Um, I've always covered teams between the Phillies and the Red Sox that had rivals and always played in yes. relatively strong divisions. I can't think of too many years since I started covering baseball in 2006 where the NL East or AL East was not really, really good. So I guess I like seeing the Phillies play the Mets 19 times, and I like seeing the yeah. Red Sox play the Yankees 19 times, and I like mm -hmm. those, those division rivalries. Um, so from that standpoint, you know, yeah, I guess, I mean, I personally will miss – that third series between the Phillies and the Braves or the Phillies and the Mets uh, or that sixth, that fifth and sixth, I should say, they'll play them four series now, two and two, two at home, two on the road, instead of three at home, three on the road. So I'll miss those extra games. But I do see the, I do see the sense in balancing out the schedule because, you know, if you are in one of those tough divisions, AL East, NL East, NL West, for that matter, mm -hmm. you know, yes. you're obviously playing a much tougher schedule than, let's say, if you were in the Central. And this balances it out a little bit. Certainly, the weaker divisions will still have extra games within their division, um, so it doesn't balance it completely, but it does put people on a little bit more of a level playing field. And when you have a you know wild cards at stake, where you're fighting for playoff spots with teams that are no longer just teams in your division, I, I, I guess this is something that had to be done. Um, you know, I think that, you know, look, I mean, there have been years past where we look at wild card races and we say, oh, you know, that team from that weak division is going to have a, is going to have an advantage because they get to, you know, if you're last year, for example, if you were in the, uh, you know, if you were, let's say the, 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 you know, and this, this amplifies how bad the Brewers were down the stretch, right? But if you were the Brewers, yeah. you know, and you were vying for the wild card with the Phillies and the Phillies are having to play the Braves and the Mets, um, and even the Marlins all the time, uh, and you're getting to play the Reds and the Pirates, you know, then certainly it's a situation where it's a much easier road for you. So I understand why they did it. I'm going to miss the extra division games. I am glad that you still play your division more often um, than, than outside. And I, I don't mind the interleague, never have. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm willing to accept it. But, uh, yeah, there's something I'll miss a little bit about, um, you know, those extra rivalry games. Scott, always a pleasure. Thanks so much. Always enjoy the conversation and uh, do great work all the time. That's why we read it all the time. Thanks, Steve. Anytime.